Well, thanks for having me. I, um, I'm interested in talking about a, something that uh, I discovered was a problem back in the late 1990s. We were doing a clinical trial at Ohio State. I was actually funding the trial. And um, we were looking at the patterns of sleep apnea. And in the end, we were doing a blinded trial against uh, the standard polysomnography. And in the end, uh, it looked like we had a lot of false positives with the technology we were using. Then I looked at the, techno at the patterns and realized that those were the patterns of sleep apnea. So I decided to look back at the uh, origin of the gold standard they were using and found out it was just simply guessed in 1970s. So I thought that was a revelation. I thought people would be very excited about it, but what I discovered was that no one cared. That actually they were happy to use the gas. They were able to use the gas and incorporate it into their uh, clinical trials. And they had, in a sense, a consensus measurement of the disease that they were all happy with. And there was really nothing anyone could do about it. So I later recognized that this problem had evolved in the 80s and was a major problem across the board and that it evolved for decades. So I have uh, sort of coined the term of pathological consensus to describe this phenomenon, which is simply a, an amplification of pathological science described by Langmar. So pathological science was, uh, Langmar described it in 1953, it was once an oddity, sort of uh, undetected measurement error that um, in, in a laboratory that caused uh, people to think they've discovered something because their research, uh, but their research would not be reproducible. So the um, Langmer described this in a group of different discoveries that turned out not to be true. So the, what happened was with pathological science, it was expanded to be applied worldwide. And we're gonna show exactly how that happened. And the extent of waste is profound. So in pathological science, it's the, where the methodology has an unrecognized apical error in measurement upstream, and, but the scientific method looks pristine. The deck looks perfect. There's a gigantic gaping hole in the hull. So a someone coming along and looking at the uh, at the boat would think that everything was perfect, and certainly um, the Cochrane review would, would come back perfect, but there's an, there's an underlying uh, pathology that's going to make the boat sink. So Dr. Langmer described this as, as people that are perfectly honest, they're enthusiastic, but they fool themselves. They, they, um, and of course, the first principle is that you can't fool yourself because you're the easiest person to fool, of course. According to Dr. Feynman, it certainly it's true, and especially a group can fool themselves. They, and this is what we're talking about: consensus groups fooling themselves. So researchers just fool themselves with the origin of pathological consensus. In the 1980s, the emergence of threshold decision making by uh, Pawker et al. In, in published in New England Journal around 1980, and this idea that you could come up with these thresholds and define a disease. So a group of docs would get together and use a Delphi method or some other method of that they sort of pseudoscientific method of consensus and develop a set of criteria for a syndrome. But these criteria are really measurements. They're actually, in a sense, replacing measurement with these guesses. So they develop a worldwide pathological science due to standardization of the apical error. In a sense, doing what was done in the laboratory that Langmer described for things like uh, polywater and those kinds of things, but they're, they're promulgating these um, error this worldwide and standardizing the research on the error. So pathological consensus is a type of pathological science where the apical error measurement is standardized by consensus. So we've gone from the laboratory where somebody is diligently working and makes an error and then thinks they have a great discovery, but they over time that, that research fades. Here we have standardized the error. 
So pathological consensus, when we think about it the way it's being used, it's an erroneous, commonly guessed set of thresholds of nonspecific laboratory and vital measurements, which are promulgated as a consensus measurement of an adverse condition. And this often captures a set of different diseases causing non-reproducibility of the research. And examples of that are the apnea hypopnea index that I discovered was, uh, was wrong in the 1990s, SIRS, which was guessed in 1992, and then uh, multiple, deriva uh, multiple derivatives of SIRS were guessed each decade, and then sepsis-3, which is another guessed set of thresholds in, in 2016. It is hard to believe that this is actually the way science is being done, but the magnitude of the waste is beyond the pale. There have not been a single re positive reproducible sepsis trial since, to, since its origin and for 30 years. I'm going to talk a little bit about sleep apnea, which is, which is sort of the, the cycle has completed itself as, as, as it relates to uh, consensus, uh, pathological consensus in sleep apnea. So what is, uh, what's a syndrome? Well, these, I described this phenomenon called a synthetic syndrome. That's a variable sets of different diseases with similar initial clinical presentation, but diverse pathophysiology and morbidity, but they're combined by pathological consensus. So you come up with a set of thresholds that define this syndrome that you think is similar, but that's actually comprised of a whole group of diseases. We saw this happen with COVID when they thought COVID pneumonia was ARDS. Well, the criteria for ARDS was made in 2012, the latest version of it was made in 2012. They actually thought those criteria were clairvoyant and, and included COVID pneumonia, even though it didn't exist in 2012. That's how severe pathologic consent. Of course, that resulted in significant delay in, in optimization of treatment because they tried to apply the old therapy for ARDS, which didn't work for COVID. So how does this work? Well. If we make up a syndrome, if we make up a group of criteria, then we're going to capture, and these are nonspecific laboratory and vital signs, we'll capture a set of diseases, each with a potentially different average treatment effect. The percent of different diseases is going to be different for each randomized control trial, and therefore the randomized control trials aren't reproducible. This is something they just can't figure out. They don't. It's, it's strange that they don't understand this, but COVID really helped expose this. So let's look at the first ARDS, Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome, which is a severe pulmonary condition. And it, but it's actually the ARDS criteria are quite broad and nonspecific, so it captures a whole group of diseases. For instance, Adult Respiratory Distress Syndrome after uh, pancreatitis, or in associated with trauma, or or uh, pneumonia. All those diseases fall in the scope of ARDS, and they try to standardize treatment for ARDS. So as you can imagine, in the first randomized control trial, this particular uh, disease dominated. There was less of this, a lot less of this disease. And in this one, this disease dominated. So if these diseases have different average treatment effects, you're not going to have the same uh, result of your randomized control trial. This is, of course, what happened later, severe COVID pneumonia dominated. And they just include it into ARDS. Why do they include it into ARDS? Well, because in their world, they don't understand that their, uh, their guest thresholds is just a, can't, if it falls within the scope of the guest threshold, then they think it, it meets the criteria for the disease. So the fact that COVID pneumonia didn't exist when they made up the thresholds didn't occur to them that that, that was uh, not science. So let's look at the ways full cyclic history of pathologic consensus. So this emergence of synthetic syndromes that were produced by these apical guest measurements, like sleep apnea, like the apnea hypopnea index, SIRS, this produced non-reproducibility of the randomized control trials. But what they would do is just regress another group. So they would go back and they didn't understand that this process was just propagating pathologic science. So they just, every decade, they would guess a new set. They'd have a big meeting, maybe have the Delphi method or something, and guess a new set of criteria. And of course, the reproduce the reproducible randomized control trials would, would occur again. And they just keep recycling this. 
So let's look at sleep apnea. I like that one the best because it's the one I discovered first, and it's a prototypic pathological consensus. So back in the 1970s, uh, a couple of guys in a laboratory in California published a paper describing a measurement for sleep apnea. That became standardized and modified in the 1980s. This measurement was guessed. And they, they, they standardized it in the 1980s as a simple sum of these 10 second apnea and 10 second hypopnea. It became the standardized measurement for randomized controlled trials. It was found to be highly variable. So they had this meeting in Chicago and they came up with this criteria that they named Chicago, which is common. They'll name these criteria, uh, these guest criteria by, by the city that they, uh, they guessed it in. Then the research remains non-reproducible, so they, um, as expected, and then 35 years later, the AHRQ finds no um, credibility to the apnea hypopnea index. 35 years, 35 years. So the, what they identify is that insufficient evidence exists to assess the validity of the apnea hypopnea index as a surrogate and identify it just... Um, it's not valid. Now, this has to be stunning, but nobody cares. They didn't care when I first told them, and they don't care now. Um, so they don't like the results of it. You know, the sleep apnea specialist dumbfounded a critique of gold standard treatment. Well, it can't be dumbfounded. I've told them for decades that it will not work. As a matter of fact, I told them exactly what was going to happen. I said, if you use a standard measure that you guessed, and it's not uh, a good measurement of the disease, you will not be able to determine that your disease is morbid. It may well be morbid. I think it is morbid. I'm a pulmonologist to take care of sleep all the time. But you won't be able to determine it's morbid from your research because your research will be fake. But the hallmark of pathologic science is that they don't care. Overwhelming evidence of failure doesn't convince its advocates. It's very similar to chiropractic or to um, um, to different types of kind of cult-like or um, quack quackery, um, because it is in offense a little bit of quackery. We, now they don't realize it's quackery; they actually convinced it works. But it, but you know, poly water was quackery. It, it was the the people that believed in poly water and had the measurements for it uh, thought it was real. They weren't they weren't trying to fool anybody. They were just fooling themselves. So the problem is if we, if we incorporate a system and we, we adopt the system, we become part of the problem. We become part of the resistance to change. And that's an important point. So with pathologic consensus, even severe dissent from the field is ignored. So my dissent, you know, even though I, I laid it out very clearly, it really kind of couldn't get published back in those days because you know, they, they didn't have the open access journals, so they would publish only what they uh, what they believe was true. And, and, and arguments against the apnea hypopnea index were not very uh, publishable in, in the early days. But in 2013, they point out the apnea hypopnea index does not appear to be a proper measurement. In 2016, if it remains a holy grail in sleep and respiratory medicine, the science will certainly not advance, which in turn will retard the clinical and public response to disease. So 2016 is about 16 years after I told them this was going to happen. They're starting to realize it, but that still doesn't help. So this paper, which came out in 2021, I believe, it's wishful thinking. There's only the rise of pathological consensus. It's protected socially from falling. It will not fall. This is even the thought leader capitulation. The thought leaders, one of the thought leaders here, they wrote a paper saying it's clear that it, that it is either adequate or sufficient to find a president. That really doesn't matter. They'll still do it. And actually in the paper, they talk about, well, maybe we need to just say which measurements we use to define the apnea hypopnetics. They don't give up on it. They don't recall it. It just continues. And, but what, that's what it requires, pathological, consensus requires a formal recall. They mandated it. They required it for research. That Now that we recognize it's incorrect, you have to recall it. Patient subjects should not be asked to participate in trials using incorrect measurements just because the doctors think they're, they, they want to keep using it because it's expedient to keep using it. 
future waste must be prevented. We have to have a form of recall, like an automobile recall. We can't just let this sort of die over the next decade. So we have decades of wasted research and a form of recall is the only answer. The pathologic, it cannot be allowed to just fade away. And no one argues that this is wrong. No one argues what I'm saying is wrong. They just won't engage. They won't talk about it. They won't say anything because they know it's true. The pathologic consensus was formally promulgated, so it has to be recalled with the same vigor. So what what do we do? This is we know we know that the research it doesn't work. SIRS has been already abandoned. The Abney High Poppin Index is is a joke. Sepsis three doesn't really work. These are all made up stuff. We can't build on unreliable results. It's been going on for decades. Do we repeat it? Do we go back and look at all the studies that were done with these and recognize none of them produce any value and calculate the magnitude of the waste? Is that something we can do? Despite the social forces of expedience, we just can't tolerate it anymore. Do we inform the public? What can be done? This is actually a form of embedded quackery. Now I use that term kind of boldly here, but it is, I don't know if a person is engaged in quackery if they believe in what they're doing. These people believe in what they're doing, but it really doesn't work. So we, again, in summary, pathological science develops in a laboratory. We have apical error and measurement. Pathologic consensus is when you take it, when you have a, a apical error and you standardize it. You're trying to standardize and randomize controlled trials, so you set up the criteria for the trial, and that's erroneous. So basically, you've standardized the error, and that's what happened. So pathologic consensus lacks the rigor of measurement of disease, so it generates non-reproducible results. And these are not useful for randomized control trials or inflexible treatment protocols. So it must be recalled. So what's the next step? Well, it's embedded in the social fabric of critical care and sleep apnea. And no matter what we do, there's probably little we can do. They, they, the people that engage in this have taught it all their life. I taught it back until 1990. I taught the apnea apartment index myself. So, I, you know, I was trained in polysonography. I thought it was all based on science. I never realized we didn't have the internet. Then I got a, I got a um, librarian to go back and look at the history. She and I found that basically it was all made up, you know. Um, so it has to be recalled, but who can recall it? Who can really do anything about it? You know, I've been trying to get something done for 30 years and, and you know, you, there's nothing really that can be done. I mean, I appreciate this group, but, you know, what can we really do? So the questions have risen about the policing of science, who's responsible for policing? The answer is all of us, but if it's all of us, it's none of us. You know, somebody has to try to do it. Uh, somebody has to try to figure out how to solve this problem. And uh, I remember we applied for a grant uh, for uh, looking at the patterns of sepsis, trying to really understand what sepsis is. You know, it, it, sepsis is one of those uh, synthetic syndromes that comprise of a whole host of infections. And um, the reviewers in our in our um, in our request for the to, for funding the. Uh, we, we said that sepsis really doesn't have a good, you know, there's no agreement on what it really is. And we have to determine these trajectory and the relational time patterns of it to understand all the different components. And the reviewer snapped back to us, we know what sepsis is, and it's sepsis three. Well, sepsis three is based on SOFA, which was made up by a guy in 1996. But that is the state of the present science of, of disease. So, Because most I had mostly men here, and it's 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 a it's a tragedy of the past that we didn't have the the women making these determinations. These are all uh, the kind of products of heady um, um, ideas in the past. But obviously, we have um, we have a big challenge if we're going to actually really try to solve this. Um, and I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to do it, but that's one of the reasons I'm here talking to this group. So thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Lawrence. So if you could put your cameras back on.
um, pretty boring what you've been talking about because actually I realized that sepsis is very complex, uh, has a very complex definition and uh, but I was when you were talking, I was just thinking about many other conditions where we use completely subjective scales. Let's take psychiatry, let's take uh, uh, other behavioral conditions and uh, neurological conditions. How much is pathological consensus might be there and who should investigate it? Um, so fascinating talk. I'm looking forward to, to your questions, comments from the audience. Hi, uh, Jack. Yes, please. So I, um, I, I found your talk fascinating and um, I'm going to go and look up what you've written on this uh, after, after, after the talk. But I'll, I'll ask a slightly more positive question because it seems to me that the general problem you identify is a very broad one, right? So my background's in drug and biotech investment. I spend a lot of my time looking at clinical trials that haven't worked. And, and, and often it seems to me in diseases, diseases where actually the sort of pathophysiological entity is not clearly defined, right? Or, uh, uh, but one does see in some areas sort of improvements are made. You know, the application of sort of genetic in oncology, for example, is in some cases more coherent pathophysiological entities. So I guess my question is this, can you think of any examples where actual real progress has been made? People have sort of dumped terrible old disease classifications and sort of operational definitions and sort of measurements and actually then substituted them for much better ones. Yeah, I think that uh, the field of oncology that you've identified is an area where, you know, we, we used to consider uh, conditions together, you know, adenocarcinoma of the lung was one classification, and now we we see it as uh, as separated. So there, there, but those those were still conditions where we had pathology, and we had uh, you know, we were pretty far along in in being relatively precise within the capabilities that we had. These new these other conditions that I'm describing here are conditions where in the 1980s, or for instance, in the 1970s, uh, a guy, a, a, they came up with an idea of adult respiratory distress syndrome. They called it adult respiratory distress syndrome because the similarity at that time was to uh, res respiratory distress syndrome of, of the neonate. So the Tom Petty came up with this idea and he actually um, he accepted that he was a lumper that this was a syndrome. And then he, they came up with criteria for these syndromes. And unfortunately, over time, you know, these, these, this syndrome captures a group of diseases. Now, Tom Petty even suggested to add pneumonia to it. We, we thought he was playing around with those kind of ideas that, that you would combine, say, pulmonary dysfunction due to pancreatitis and post-trauma to pneumonia. You know, when you can bring all those together from a pathophysiologic perspective, these are not in any way related. But it, but that actually prevailed and it evolved to the point where when COVID pneumonia developed, it was called ARDS. And all the, all the treatment for COVID was applied as if it was evidence-based for COVID they, because it met the criteria from 2012 that was guessed in Berlin what they called the Berlin criteria. That's how, uh, and of course, there was a lot of morbidity associated with trying to treat COVID, severe COVID pneumonia as ARDS. A lot of mistakes made and a lot of delay in, in treatment. So that, there is much more, so, so this is a, a deeper issue. It's, it's sort of um, a rather severe mistake, you know, to think, for instance, that you can guess some measurement for apnea for the apnea for the for sleep apnea and then use that measurement for 30 years 40 years um, it's a severe mistake to think you can guess some criteria for sepsis which was done in 1989 in the first sepsis trial for steroid sepsis trial for methylprednisolone and you know when roger bone guessed that i thought he was kind of playing around i didn't think he was coming up with criteria i'm not even sure he thought he was coming up with criteria but later in 1992, they standardized his criteria, which would include things like as, as nonspecific as a white count of 12, 
um, and formed this disease out of it that captured things like uh, toxic shock due to beta strep and uh, and, uh, a, uh, 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 and can I can I ask a follow up question before yeah. shutting up and letting other people ask? Do you think there's something unusual to medicine here? And the things I'm wondering, so for example, in psychiatry, there's certainly a sense I think that yeah, amongst other things, regulation tends to set in stone diagnostic criteria that may not be very helpful, right? Uh, 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 but once the regulator starts approving drugs for a particular syndrome uh, and starts using certain measuring devices that identify that syndrome, it's hard then for people to move away from it, right? Because there wouldn't be regulatory precedent. So I just wonder whether you think it's something unusual, whether this is common to all science, but we only see it in medicine because we just look at medicine, or whether actually there's a bunch of things to do, you know, like with the popularity of meta-analysis or, or regulation or clinical guidelines um, or the ethics of clinical trials that mean it's particularly sort of stabilized and ossified in medicine in a way that it isn't in other scientific disciplines. Yeah, I think it's, I think, I think exactly right. I think there are um, the combination of desire to increase N for the randomized control trials and all the, the driving force of doing research uh, that we want to combine things to have large trials. I think all of that are driving forces for this. And I think that a lot of this is everyone has been taught these things. It's very difficult to extract separate from that. I give some deference to situations, for instance, in, in the mental health field where they really don't have the ability to do the measurements, right? They really, it's hard to do that. Uh, in our situation, in the, in the critical care field, in the field of, of um, sleep apnea, for instance, the measurements are capable, are, you can do those, but they just don't, they, they've standardized on the past and they, they just don't do it. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you both to Jack and Lawrence. Um, any other questions, reflections? I have an observation maybe uh, because I guess in my mind, I keep hearing this um, discussion and thinking what, what can be done to try to resolve it. Uh, and interestingly, Lawrence, when you said you were taught this and then you were teaching this, I did not go to medical school, and but I just have friends who did and looks like medical education is extremely demanding and uh, people are losing sleep and um, all they manage to do is just learn um, the volumes of information rather than uh, question uh, and produce scientific inquiry. Um, so is this a problem, do you think? Is this a chance to influence younger generations when they can, instead of just taking notes and passing the exams, actually ask questions where it's coming from? Yeah, I think it's a real problem. The, the... This is a process of simplification of complexity, right? So you, you have something like the, the evolution of a severe condition associated with infection. Uh, they do look similar. You know, they, they have a lot of differences in infection from beta strep, you know, um, toxic shock is different than an infection from a perforated bowel, uh, you know, and it, it, there is a different, there are different manifestations, but you can combine them, and I think it helps from a standpoint of quality and from education side to be able to bring things together and create objects that contain, uh, that create sets and, and learn about sets. I think that, so from, a, from the standpoint of improving quality, uh, from a billing standpoint here on this side of the pond anyway, uh, for, those are all, the sets or the syndromes are useful. I think I think they're useful from that perspective. The problem is when we fool ourselves and think they're real, and you can do randomized controlled trials with them. You know that that's just not going to work. And people have a tendency to do randomized controlled trials with what they use clinically. The other problem is when you think you can rigidly protocolize something like a syndrome that was made up by some people, and then you apply a rigid protocol to that, and you wind up with a new disease like COVID and you, you have significant morbidity because it's the wrong treatment for COVID. So that's the, that, so that's the danger uh, of it, but I agree with you. It, it's, it's an efficient way. You know, that's how we think, right? We think in objects 
our objects uh, capture different components. So when we think of a door, we're thinking of all the components of the door. I think it's the way we have to teach, uh, but we have to teach that, you know, that there are, um, that this is just a, a way of thinking and it's not a rigid, you know, I haven't taught, when I tell you about sepsis, I haven't told you about a disease. I've told you about a, a set that we sort of capture and think globally about, but it's not something that, that the scientist in the laboratory is going to to think is a, a real entity that they can study with randomized control trial. Thank you, Lauren. So we'll go to John and then to David. All right, uh, Lawrence, thank you for a, a really interesting, thoughtful presentation. I agree with Jack. Uh, these aren't things I usually think about, um, but uh, and I, I just want to ask you um, sort of an evolutionary question. So you very nicely uh, presented sort of the development of this pathological syndrome from the 50s all the way to now. Um, it made me think a little bit, of, it, it almost seemed like religiosity. Um, certainly here at the US, we've seen extremes be, being amplified. That's even true in the UK. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about where we are right now. Is it better in your, in your thought uh, or worse, or hasn't it changed at all? And if it is better or worse, what are the drivers? You talked about open access. Um, you know, certainly things have changed. So I'd like to get your perspective on, um, are we doing a better job or um, are we doing, uh, are we getting even worse? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think the answer is we're doing a better job. I think there is a, a move to try to move toward phenotypes. So we say there are, there are phenotypes of sepsis, so trying to separate out the phenotypes, that has some value. There was a recent article that just came out, sort of a capitulation article about, about uh, sepsis, uh, suggesting that we have to move toward uh, identifying pathophysiologic uh, treatable tracts. You know, that, so these, there is this recognition of what's happening. The problem is there isn't the resignation to the truth. And they, you can't really make progress without the resignation to the truth. So if you say, well, these are phenotypes, there are phenotypes of sepsis without acknowledging that sepsis is an is a artifactual object, you actually wind up still capturing the same set with your original criteria and then separating them off in phenotypes. This is not productive. This is all this does is is continue the same failed methodology for another decade. That's what I'm concerned about. And I'm guilty of that too. At first I thought, well, maybe the phenotype approach is the way to go, you know, and, uh, and I, but, but I don't think it is. I think it's better to think about these as separate diseases and study them as separate diseases. Uh, the phenotype is still keeps the same problem. Yes. So if that answers your question. Yeah. David. Yes. When you, when I zoom out, it seems to me that very little is known about medicine. It's very much in its early stages. Medical research has only been going for less than a hundred years in a serious way, so it's not surprising no one's to blame because it's very complicated. But people tend to overclaim what's known all of the time. Um, the late John Diamond, uh, who was a good journalist who died of cancer, wrote a tirade against cancer quackery, which was very effective, and he put part of the blame on that on regular medicine because people have been misled into thinking that there's a magic bullet for every condition and if they can't get it they get indignant and they run to quacks. Uh, I think overclaiming what medicine can do has done quite a good deal of harm including encouraging quackery. Most meta-analysis for example I come to become very skeptical about because it it's a question of garbage in garbage out only too often the nice reviews Cochrane reviews perhaps worse always tend to come up with something works or may well work on the basis of terrible evidence uh, I've, perhaps meta-analysis is the poor man's substitute for doing some research 
these are just comments, not questions, I'm afraid, but I'd be glad to have your opinion of them. Yeah, they're good comments. Uh, I I think that the, um, I think if you look at, to probably look at Cochrane, for instance, and it's, it's approach, right? They, they, I remember they, they have a six point or at least what I've read, they kind of have a six point review looking at, at a trial. Um, and I think they do some good work looking at the, the statistics of a trial and whether the sample size was adequate and all that sort of thing. But they don't go deeper into whether or not the, you know, for instance, the measurements were correct. And here, for instance, these criteria, Cochrane would never look at the apnea hypopnea index and say, well, you know, that's a variable measurement and, and you really can't get reproducible randomized control trials from that because we haven't for 30 years. So, but that's probably what Cochrane needs to do. So you have to look, you can't just look at the, at the deck. You have to look at the hull and, and look at the past. The way I found out, for instance, the apnea hypopnea index was made up was by going back into the archives, you know, with a librarian and finding out where it came from. And uh, if you go back to the origin of many of the things we believe in medicine, they, they, they come from some, from non-science. They aren't science. And yet we've standardized them and we think they're science and we built an entire industry, an entire, um, an entire discipline on it and it's a uh, you know it's a house of cards um, and we ignore the non-reproducibility so I, I think that your point is we think your well, I understand your point to be we think we know more than we do and and we have produced these these uh, objects that that really contain variety of different conditions and we think we know something about them but we're fooling ourselves so i agree with that yes there's entire empty classes of drugs i think um, which go back to the year dot i mean things like expectorants or cough suppressants even there's nothing that makes you nothing that can suppress a cough in general <laughs> and not not allow not while allowing you still to breathe at least uh, and uh, th these classifications have generated were generated many years ago on a, a totally unsound basis i suspect um thank you and i think it's a really good comment and especially about the lack of reproducibility and uh, it became very apparent how much we're lacking with uh, successes of reproducibility in biological sciences so lots of examples where uh, either industry or volunteering groups or researchers tried to reproduce basic science and they ran into a lot of disappointment, hoping to reproduce actual clinical trials. That's, um, th that's a much more difficult undertaking. So I think I keep hearing from, from, from what you've seen, <coughs> been saying, Lawrence, that perhaps going back to the library for some conditions would be the way forward and to try to figure out the baseline. Um, so I'm still trying to find uh, solutions <laughs> with it rather than lamenting on just the problem. But Rob, why, uh, why don't you tell us what, what you think or ask a question? Thank you, Dr. Lynn, it's nice to see you. It's been a long time. Um, yeah. <laughs> our, our hyperventilation days. Um, really, uh, Elizabeth, like you, I'm the non-medical school participant here. Um, but to Jack's point, I really think there's a much broader implication of, of you know, what you're demonstrating here, Dr. Lin. And I think it's really any scientific study, any um, kind of trial, I think it, it's, it goes much beyond just the AHI and, you know, the, the randomized control medical trials that you're talking about. I think there's much broader implication and quite a bit of you know, almost any scientific research, I think there's very well could be a, a pretty good um, hint of this throughout, throughout that research, not just specifically focused to, to medical trials such as this. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I think that, um, that this is a tendency of people to 
uh, to think in objects, as I indicated, and we simplify. We, uh, we have a tendency to oversimplify, and we work toward, toward simplification. And there's always a process to sort of dumb down things, and we, we go too far with it. You know, that's, I think that the stuff, the, Rob, the threshold science stuff that, that, that we've talked about in terms of critical care monitoring, where you use a threshold warning tool instead of the actual time series pattern of the evolution of the disease, the relational evolution of the disease, we warn at an oxygen saturation of 90%, which can give you either a false sense of security or or uh, or um, or two or two or alarm fatigue. You know, so those are the kind of things. So it's it's a ubiquitous problem, but I think that the trying to focus on these areas, these specific areas of say sepsis and using apnea hypopnea or sleep apnea as a prototypical failure i think we have to eventually come to some kind of solution i think that what bothers me about the whole industry the whole science industry the randomized control trial industry multi-billion dollar industry is that they're reticent to do anything about anything any problem there's no there is no authority to go to you know, I could contact the people who were running these randomized control trials in an, I could meet up with them at a, at a conference and they would all, none of them would argue with me, they'd all just run away. They don't want to talk about this kind of thing. They don't want to, to deal with this kind of thing. They want to sit and talk about the things that they all believe in, the, in their box. And they have a lot of discussion, you know, within that box. It, it's, it's not that much different than the geocentric model. But I think if you walked up to a geocentric scientist back in the day and started talking to them about the fact that maybe that geocentric science has some issues, I don't think they'd just run away the same way these people run away. There's nothing you can do about it. If you run, if they run away and they won't engage, you can write papers. You can, you know, I wrote a paper about SIRS and then they did abandon SIRS in 2015. Uh, I wrote a paper in 2012 showing it had no potential value and it had been used for 20 years, they abandoned it, but then they just substituted another sofa, which had been guessed in, in 1996. So I don't know what you could do. I think that if this group can figure out something that can actually be done, I think that's what's important. Because for me, I've experienced already 20 years, 25 years of failure, of inability to actually make a difference, to actually you have all this knowledge about where the problems are and no one will disagree that you're wrong but you can't do anything about it because no one will do anything and i think that and they just continue to do the same thing because it results in um you know uh, basically clicks and and career advancement it's very scary on this side of the atlantic to oppose these kind of things you know, careers, you, you try to advance your career, you're trying to advance, you know, I, I frankly don't need their grants, so I can do it. But a lot of people that need their grants, uh, they, they simply can't do it. So I, I'm hoping there's someone in this group who can figure out a way for us to actually make a difference. Because otherwise, we're just a group of people talking about a problem that everybody actually kind of knows exists, but nobody will do anything about. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, what is the current situation actually with sleep apnea? Uh, because as, if you say that uh, here, it was acknowledged that it was a mistake to begin with, do you think now there's a chance for better science or not really? Like, it, do you, do you, have you started seeing the changes or not? Well, that's a good question because so in, in um, you know, I showed the paper, the rise and fall of the apnea hypopnea index. The AHRQ came out uh, right right after that, showing that sleep apnea, you know, the AHI didn't work. Then a consensus paper has come out now from the group of thought leaders that use the AHI for decades. And some of them are just, you know, they're in the box advocates for the AHI. They're, they're going to die, believe in the AHI. And, the, and then some of them show some signs that they want to add something else. But in the consensus paper, if you read it, it reads exactly like that. Like some of the people that wrote part of it completely recognize that it's largely valueless. And some of the re people that wrote part of it are still arguing, well, we can use it, but we just have to say 
what components we have to let people know how we how we're measuring the AHI. What, whether we're using a thermistor or a, or or what kind of um, equipment we're using and that sort of thing. So no, I don't see what I don't see is actually a resignation or that 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 they admit it doesn't work, but they don't say what they're going to do. They they don't. So that is some progress. They actually have admitted it didn't work in this capitulation paper. I thought the paper was going to be propaganda. I read it I, as I'm reading it, and then at the bottom of it, they actually say that the, it's not going to work going forward. They have to do something else. So maybe we'll get something out of the AHI. It's possible, but um, I don't see them coming up with any. I, the paper still has a lot of propaganda in it. A lot of arguments about the value of AHI and it's still good and you know that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, we touch upon this in a number of discussions that we have here um, that we very much reward success, uh, what, however society currently defines it with innovation, with potential profits, with potential headlines. Um, and headlines are made about promises of cures and uh, something very exciting. When you start telling people, hold on, you've been wrong for 30 years, or hold on, we've been doing science uh, in this particular disease area incorrectly for all this time, um, uh, this should make headlines, I think. <laughs> it should be making many more headlines than potential discovery of something that worked in rats and tomorrow should cure cancer for all. So, but it's not how human mind works. It's not how media works and it's not how money making strategies work. So, and even if, for example, we inaugurate a prize tomorrow for discoveries like uh, you describe in sleep apnea um, uh, shattering the establishment and saying, hold on, this, this is not true. This is how it should be done. Um, is it, it goes against human nature. And I think that's why we're so stuck, not just in the field that you described, but in many areas that we're touching upon in terms of integ integrity of science. It, it People are not good at admitting that They've done something wrong. They're not good thinking, hold on, I'm about to retire and um, everything I've been doing is just not on the right path. So um, I, do you think this might be a blocking thing and blocking point or there are also technical issues that stay on the way why we can't um, better resolve um, th this conflict? No, I think I think it's a I think it's a social constraint. Uh, there are we're fully capable of doing a better job in in uh, for instance, especially with sleep apnea and measuring disease much better and coming up with so yeah no I think it's completely a largely a social constraint. Jack, I see you. Yeah, so this is just some sort of random anecdotes, really. Um, but I can think of a few areas where progress has been made or might be made right so for example my view is that where enormous amounts of money can be sold from selling expensive new drugs and where drug companies are very very motivated to improve disease taxonomy right in oncology for example disease taxonomy is improved um uh, I, and I don't know enough about many other areas to know how much that's the case, but I think in asthma, you may see a similar sort of slicing, sort of molecular slicing and dicing and subcategorization. Um, and then there are also a number of new technologies available, some genomic, but some other, where I think in some therapy, in some diseases, you can do sort of just large, effectively observational work where you do sort of high throughput shotgun proteomics to look at the proteins that are expressed in people's blood and if you do that prospectively what you find is you know diseases that you previously thought were one disease actually turn out to be three or four right so, that, so there are certain sort of technical um solutions at least in some therapy therapy areas and again i think in psychiatry there are sort of nih funded or nimh funded efforts to try and improve the classification of the sort of underlying to try and understand the underlying pathophysiology better, to realise that depression actually may not be a coherent entity, but there are sort of underlying things that are 
maybe more coherent. An example is anhedonia or ahedonia. Um, but, but, it, but it seems to me that those things happen where it's in the interests of people, you know, to make them happen. And I wonder whether you have the biggest problems of sort of old, unhelpful syndromes precisely in those therapy areas where people can't make money by challenging the old um, established syndromes. I, I know that's a question rather than, rather than a statement. I just wonder if that's true. Like in apnea, for example, I don't, if people are selling, are people selling apnea drugs or actually is it quite cheap devices? So it's in no one's interest to spend a huge amount of money to work out whether the classification is correct. Well, I think that's right. I think that, uh, for instance, in the sepsis, so, so it goes beyond a little bit beyond that too. In the sepsis area, for instance, no one really understood those syndromes or why they were not real. And so they had all kinds of drug trials over time and they were not successful. So eventually companies just abandoned that market, abandoned doing research in that field. So from that perspective, and there were a, a whole variety of technology companies that, that grew up in the sleep apnea environment trying to simplify the diagnosis of sleep apnea, but they were held back by the complexity of the apnea hop apnea index and having to match a uh, highly variable result in a in you know in a in a trial so these syndromes have a way of self-protecting because they they stop the, the productivity of good uh treatment so uh, or good good investigation hmm. so i think that's so so some sort of a book or some sort of a document that shows that that this is fundamental to stopping the progress of science uh, and so once, I think you're right, once, once inroads are actually made and people recognize, for instance, in the oncology area that, you know, everything is not adenocarcinoma and there's, there are tracks to go, then, um, then they, they see that there's money to be made there and they proceed, right? But, but until you recognize these syndromes are not real and until the gate can open up and you can actually get past the medical reviewers, who are stopping, they're the gatekeepers saying, no, you have to use the apnea hop apnea index, or you have to use the sepsis three definition. You know, you can't, you have to get through that. There's a variety of gatekeepers that are there. The funding gatekeeper that'll make you do it. The, uh, the publishing gatekeeper, all of them are holding the line on these uh, syndromes and stopping the progress. So I agree with you. Yeah. 100%, yeah. Thank you, David. Last question or comment from you before we wrap up. Yes, one thing that I did come across in my erstwhile job in Iron Channels was to realize <laughs> how very complicated apparently simple conditions are. Um, chronic myasthenic syndrome, which is caused by simple, relatively simple uh, inherited mutations in the muscle nicotinic receptor that turned out to be dozens, I forget what it's, where it's up to now, maybe 40 different mutations. And that explains why the, perhaps why the symptoms vary so widely. It also means that the chances of getting tailored drugs for different conditions is next to nothing because uh, the uh, one mutation which was just restricted to, to one family essentially, and that that makes personalized medicine almost impossible as far as i can see and that that's a simple condition i mean if you're talking about depression or anxiety god knows where where you start so, same with um cystic fibrosis i think there's 1500 different mutations last time i checked in, in the relevant protein so there's 1,500 sorts of cystic fibrosis. Yeah, I think that the, the, the on one side, the massive complexity, you know, is a spectrum, right? But, but we have to get past the basic profound oversimplification into some sort of area where we can actually make some progress. And uh, I think that's, there has to be some means to do that, right? Whether that's informing the public, you know, that, uh, all of this money is being wasted on this research um, and there, there has to be somebody in the public that cares about that uh, and I think that 
the apnea, the, the sleep apnea world is, is what I call a complete cycle of pathologic consensus. It's complete because it started decades ago and has reached a point of complete futility where, you know, it, it, so that is something that could be presented as evidence of the futility of 30 years of research and how much funding went into that and all the statistics and all the work that everybody did to do that all based on the guess by a couple of guys in uh, you know in California in 1970s that really that would be a great story to kind of show why science goes the way it does what why why we waste so much money and um, and I think that that uh, hopefully somebody will hear write that book, but I, I don't know. We have to figure out what how to how to solve this problem. Thank you, Lawrence. Looks like out of all of us, you're in the best position to at least start the book. So please. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I think I might what do we it. can do is try to promote it. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing this very important life work and uh, I can only imagine how much is undiscovered there yet in terms of what we assume is standard of care and um, accepted uh, consensus thresholds that we use.